Alice, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. So you're in Philadelphia today because you're speaking to the Fire Student Network Conference, the annual summer conference we do around here. And I think rightfully so, you've had an interesting past year and a half, right? <laughs> haven't you? Yes, it has been interesting. Yeah. Which, which parts of it do you want to talk about? Well, I've got a bunch of papers in front of me uh, detailing all of the inter interestingness and also a book that plays almost into everything that's happened to you over the past year and a half. But let's start with, you read your bio, I introduced your bio here at the beginning. We talk about how you were formerly a professor at Northwestern University's uh, <laughs> Feinberg School. you say worst? <laughs> <laughs> Freudian slip. <laughs> Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine. Why the former? Yeah, so when this book, which is about academic freedom, Galileo's Middle Finger, was coming out, just as I was doing the final lawyering and the page proofing, uh, we also had coming out in my program a journal that we used to publish every year, and it was uh, a journal called Atrium, and mm -hmm. it was I called it a tapas journal. It had little short essays on a particular theme. Every issue had a theme. And so I was asked to edit the 2000, I think it was 13 issue, and I with my colleagues decided to do the issue around the topic of bad girls because I do feminist work and disability mm -hmm. studies and sex studies and all that kind of stuff. So we thought this would be a good theme. So we're a medical humanities and bioethics group. So the idea was for people to write proposals based on that idea. And we sent out a call for proposals as we always did. We got about 35 proposals back. Out of that, I could choose about 13. One of them was a piece called Head Nurse, which was by a cultural anthropologist, Bill Peace, out of Syracuse University. Yeah. And it was the story of uh, what happened to him in 1978 when he was 18 years old and became spinal cord injured, namely that he was unsure whether or not he had a sexual future. The doctors wouldn't answer his questions. He had a close relationship with a nurse who ended up giving him oral sex to reassure him that he, in fact, could have a future sexual life. He tells the story in a way that is, to my mind, non-pornographic, is a story about the history of disability, history of sexuality. To me, it was like, you know, a little startling as a story, but totally believable, legitimate. We know this history existed. But so, it's, 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 it's a piece of scholarship or that area of scholarship. There's not much about disability and sex in the canon, right? I mean, no, there's a ton. There is? <laughs> yes. Well, he talks, uh, I read Bill Peace's uh, blog post about this, and he talks about how 20 years ago there was this book written, I forget, it's Shakespeare. Not not William Shakespeare. Oh, Bill Shakespeare. Bill Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he had he had written a book about this that brought it into the mainstream, at least within academic circles. But since then, it, it, in some circles, it's still a taboo topic. It certainly is in academia in terms of talking about disability at all is uh -huh. still a fairly marginalized field and talking about sexuality at all. And so it's not a place we talk enough about. And certainly the history is pretty lost. And so yeah. Bill was recovering in some ways a lost history, particularly for men that were in these long term rehabilitation facilities. Yeah. So um, when it was published, it was sent out as usual to the 3000 subscribers on paper and put up online. And then one night, apparently my dean Eric Nielsen decided to read the issue and discovered this article and decided that it violated a branding agreement with the hospital corporation to which he had basically sold the medical school. That's Northwestern University Medicine or Northwestern Medicine? Northwestern Memorial Hospital. Okay. And the merger of the two created this entity called Northwestern Medicine. Yeah. And so I was told it was being taken offline. I should shut up and not say anything about <laughs> it, which was awkward because I had this book coming out about academic freedom. But I tried to fix it internally for with my colleagues for about 15 months. One of my colleagues resigned over, Christy Kirshner, who's yeah. a physician who does disability studies, resigned over the censorship. And Bill and I finally said, you know, we're going to talk publicly about it. They said, okay, put it back. But we talked publicly about it anyway because we thought it was so kind of ironic that he was talking about the censorship of people with disabilities in terms of their sexuality, the yeah. silencing of it, the suppression of it, and what happened. But the same thing all over again. Yeah, yeah. And you, they they asked you to take down just that one article, right? But you were like, no, I'm going to take down the entire thing if you're going to ask us to take down. Well, my my colleague, uh, Katie Watson, who's a lawyer and who also uh, is the main editor for yeah. the journal, made the decision to take down all of the issues at once. Mm -hmm. But she didn't say why, which I felt like was in some ways a good decision because it was kind of a solidarity. But if you don't say why, then nobody knows what's going on. So yeah. all of the issues simply disappeared, which was, mm -hmm. to my mind, 
quite problematic. Much more disturbingly, Nielsen decided to create what he called a new editorial committee, which was a committee consisting of the PR department and the dean's office to tell us what we were and were not allowed to publish in the in the journal from then on, which none of us could take because we're like, you can't tell us what we can and can't yeah. publish. So they decided, my department decided to try to look for money elsewhere to publish the magazine slash journal. They're not currently doing that. And I went to the provost's office and tried to get an assurance that they understood this was censorship and mm-hmm. that it would, to assure me it would not occur again to withdraw the editorial committee that we called the censorship committee. And um, our de- our provost, Dan Lidzer, would not do that. So I ended up resigning quite publicly. Were, were you working with uh, Katie and Christy throughout this entire process to try and figure out a resolution? I mean, what was your guys' thought process about this? Had you any, ever encountered something like this before within I think we were all pretty stunned that they would actually cite a branding agreement as a reason to suppress Mm -hmm. scholarship Um, so we had not encountered that sort of bald-faced branding stuff before but it was really stressful so all of us were on non-tenured lines and I can explain what that was if you're interested, but yeah. many people work within academia now without tenure lines. Mm-hmm. You know, I have economic security because of my writing and speaking, but also because I'm married to somebody with a stable income. And Katie, uh, Christy is a physician, so she doesn't have to worry too much about her income, but Katie is a part-time person at the medical school, does have to worry about her income. So it's yeah. a very stressful situation to find yourself in having pissed off the dean. Yeah. So it was, um, we did talk to each other, but I will say it was a very stressful 18 months. Yeah, what did your college, colleagues think? Did they know this was happening? Well, when it's not it the ones occurred, working at the atrium, of course, who yeah, of my, course knew about it. My but. internal colleagues knew about it. I started talking to more and more colleagues about it uh-huh. because it was quite disturbing trying to get their advice about it. I talked to Jeff Stone at University of Chicago, yeah. for example, talked to you guys. I mean, it really was a question, what should we do about it in terms of how do we make sure that people understand this is probably not a singular instance. If this is happening to somebody like me, it's odds are it's happening to other people as well. I just happen to be somebody with the resources and the big mouth to say something about it. Yeah. But I think it's fair to say it's probably happening all over the place. Yeah, well, it, we went public with it, at least on our end, in May of last year. Right. What was the response from the university to you and just publicly? You know, they didn't say anything to me because what are they going to do? Because they yeah. know anything they say to me, I'll use it. The story <laughs> got picked up everywhere. Yeah. It did. Well, that's partly because, as I described in Galia's Middle Finger, I know how to do media relations. And yeah. this is one of the things I said to them, right? So when I went in originally to the dean's office and I said, don't do this, like undo the censorship, don't censor us, I said to them, you know, have you Googled me? Like, do you know who you're talking to here? Like, I'm not a minor character in academic freedom. I'm not somebody who rolls over and plays dead when people do something that I think is stupid. And they just kept saying to me in this very Orwellian fashion, congratulations on your forthcoming book. That's all they would say. Wow. (laughs) It's kind of crazy making. The the funny thing about a lot of censors, and we talk about this during the podcast a lot, is they don't realize that it's going to backfire. And you're going to get the dry sand effect. And the thing that you didn't want people to see, more people are going to see now as a result. I'm sure, sure Bill Peace's article is probably one of the most read Easily. articles ever published by the atrium. Easily. It far outsurpasses every other article. I've been told that. And it's been read by tens of thousands more people than it would have been read uh-huh. by if if this had not happened. And so in a way, that's really great. But it should not have come to this, obviously. Yeah. yeah. So where, where is the atrium now? Is it still being published? No, it's not currently being published. And I don't know if my colleagues have plans to do so. You know, ultimately, part of the reason I left was because I was in this position at that point in my department where my colleagues were afraid of whatever I was going to do next. Mm -hmm. I had gotten in trouble for other projects as well, although not by my administration. By The Mm -hmm. FDA got mad at me at one point for one project I worked on. The transgender community got mad at me for another project. You know, I've had people upset with me. And so they're... They had had to live through a bunch of angry people, right? Uh But when it's your own dean, it's very, very (laughs) uncomfortable. So my choice was either to give up the kinds of work that I do, which is kind of hard-hitting engagement work, or, you know, live with the fact that I was making my colleagues constantly scared and uncomfortable. And I love them. I didn't want to do that to them. Yeah. Well, you're also someone who's always stood on your principles. I went to one of your speeches earlier this year, and you talked about how, I don't recall the specifics, but you resigned from some board on on principle. I forget what board it was uh, where there was disagreement. So you're not afraid to leave if the environment isn't conducive to you. I do try to stick things out and work with people as much as possible. You you spent 14 months trying to do this before you went public. 14 months before we went public and then 18 months before I resigned. I mean, I really Uh do try to fix the systems within within the inside, but Uh there's some places where you just can't do that, where the people in power are people who can't kind of see the light. And then at that point, you have to make the decision. Are you contributing to something that you really kind of makes you sick to your stomach. And if you could afford to leave, do you leave? Yeah. Well, this was this Northwestern was in the headlines for more than just 
your situation with the atrium last year, also Laura Kipnis. Are you friends with Laura Kipnis? Were you no, we didn't with know each other. Happened? We didn't know each other before this. And when the stuff started to happen to her, um, I was in New York and she lives in New York. And so mm-hmm. I told her, I think we should get together and talk about what's going on because something's happening with me that I think is reflective of what's happening with yeah. you. So uh, we sat down and talked. At that point, they were kind of heavily into the kangaroo court around her Title IX case. Yeah. And I told, she had said to me, you know, they said, I'm not allowed to bring a lawyer. And I said, that's crazy. You can bring a lawyer everywhere, including into the refrigerator, yeah. into jail, wherever you are, you can get yourself a lawyer. And I said, you absolutely need a lawyer. So I talked mm-hmm. her up with some lawyers because I told her there's no way I'd go into something like that without at least one lawyer with me because what they're doing is doing an intimidation tactic right and you need somebody to fight back for you in that in that realm yeah well me and chris who's our our podcast engineer over here actually went and visited uh laura and and chelsea and spoke with her about this stuff as well she would for our listeners who aren't familiar with the story she wrote an article called uh sexual sexual paranoia strikes academe and for writing that she had a number of i think two title nine complaints filed against her just for writing about public issues uh, and the university put her in a three or four month inquisition as she called it uh, before the charges were dropped and or the investigation was dropped that is um, conveniently the investigation was dropped the day that she published uh, her story about the inquisition in the chronicle of higher education yeah so it's, there's something going on at northwestern uh, we put them on our 10 worst schools for free speech list which i enjoyed <laughs> And I'm not sure they'll gonna, they're going to be off of it in 2017 until we get an apology. Oh, uh, at least you that's guys get apologies. News. Well, I, I can't commit to it yet, but that's um, good news. Those were definitely two of the most egregious stories that we that we saw happening. Well, Northwestern yeah. is a big brand place. You know, it's a place uh-huh. where they don't want a situation where faculty at all make them look bad. So they do what they can to make sure the faculty stay in line. Yeah, we had a we recently had a case with them involving students. They didn't want to approve a student group. They thought the student group was redundant when it really wasn't. Um, they eventually relented on that, so that might win them a couple f- brownie points. But they've got a lot of w- they've got a long way to go to <laughs> make up for what was an awful 2014 and 2015. You know, it's really sad because when I went to Northwestern, which would, was 10 years earlier from when I resigned, so I was there for a decade. Mm-hmm. We had an extraordinary administration, president, and provost who were big advocates for academic freedom. And you say that in your in your res- resignation letter. Absolutely, it yeah. was such a different place. In fact, you know. We had a Holocaust denier on faculty who's an electrical engineer, appropriately mm. named Butts. <laughs> and every now and then, Professor Butts would rise up out of the mist and make some claim that the Holocaust didn't happen. And when this would happen, our provost would write to us, and he would say, he's wrong, he's an idiot, he's stupid, mm. he's against mm. the facts, and I will defend his right to say what he has to say, mm. because that's my job, is to defend mm. you all. Yeah. And I thought, my God, if I work at a place where a Holocaust denier is safe, I feel safe to do the kind of work that I do, because yeah. it's really important. I mean, I'm not saying that we should promote work that's counterfactual because his work is against the evidence uh, but that said to have a provost who's sort of willing to go to the mat for the principal was really great yeah yeah the one thing i forget who said it uh christopher hitchens said it um talks about how it's important that you have people making these crazy counterfactual claims because it forces us to re-examine our own beliefs about things we just know to be true like mm-hmm. if someone says the earth is flat well you need to be able to rebut that. Why is why? How do we know the Earth is round? You know, the Holocaust didn't happen. Well, how do we know the Holocaust yes. happened? Let's have this conversation. Yes. Let's remind of ourselves why we believe these things, so that we don't hold them as dogma or as a prejudice, as John Stuart Mill might say. But all this was happening, of course, when you were writing or doing the final, putting the finishing touches on Galileo's middle finger, which is about sort of about what happens when politics tries to get in the way of science. So tell us a little bit about that book. Yeah, so I, the way I got into the book was I had been doing intersex rights work for about 10 years, which is when people are born with bodies that don't fit male or female yeah. types. So it's about anatomical differences. Mm-hmm. And when I thought I was wrapping that up, I ended up doing a history of a controversy in transgender, um, actually involving a Northwestern researcher, Mike Bailey, who yeah. has a habit of getting in trouble. And um, the... When I did that history, I thought it was going to be kind of a he said, she said history of Bailey said some offensive things and the transgender activists felt what he said was wrong and that there would be sort of a misunderstanding between them. But I, what I did find actually was that 
they had made up charges against him that were career wrecking charges mm -hmm. that they the people making them would have known were not true things like that he had uh, been doing IRB required so ethics board required uh, kinds of studies without approval from the ethics board without oversight from the ethics board that he had faked data that he had slept with a research subject when she was his research subject all these kinds of career damaging claims and what I found was that they had actually essentially fabricated it all with the goal of shutting him up because mm -hmm. he was putting forth a concept about transgender that was about eroticism, not just about gender identity. Mm -hmm. And what happened when I published that, which I could have predicted at that point and did predict at that point, they all came after me. <clears throat> and this was in 2007, 2008, when Google's algorithms were easier to manipulate. Mm -hmm. So they basically rewrote my entire life online and changed who I was and what I believed yeah. I was portrayed as a eugenicist, as somebody who wanted to put intersex people in the gas chambers. I was portrayed as a tool of the Catholic Church, which I found kind of odd since I'm an atheist. <laughs> um, it went on and on. It was very unpleasant. There were um, threats. There were people showing up at my office. And so I became kind of fascinated with this question of what happens when identity politics activists like the type I had been and still am in many ways, mm -hmm. what happens when they go way over the line and try to take down ideas? And the reason the book obviously is called Galileo's Middle Finger is because it sort of takes Galileo as its patron saint, somebody who was challenging an identity politics dogma, namely the Catholic Church's identity politics, mm -hmm. trying to do so with evidence and getting in huge trouble because of it. Yeah, and that title is amazing, by the way, because <laughs> if anyone's familiar with the story of Galileo, it tells you everything you need to know. In three words. It does. It does. I was really glad when Penguin was willing to use it because, and when they sent me the cover to the book, I did really laugh. Although they've now changed the cover of the book for the paperback because apparently some people complained that they thought it was a book about Galileo, which it isn't. It's a book about today. <laughs> Although you do talk about the story, uh, you talk about Galileo's story at the end of the introduction. Just a little bit, yeah. yeah. So what I ended up doing for this work, I um, actually when when the work on Bailey came out and all these people came after me. Um, Steven Pinker had read the work because he had been somewhat implicated because he had blurred Bailey's book and they went after him for a while. Uh -huh. And he said, you know, I love your writing and this story is great. You know, can I give you an introduction to my agent? And I said, actually, I really need to like reconstitute my professional <laughs> reputation because they're <laughs> ruining it. So would you help me get a Guggenheim Fellowship, which he did um, along with Dan Savage and a couple other people. Yeah. And so I spent the Guggenheim Fellowship kind of wandering the country talking to other academics who had been uh -huh. set upon by identity politics groups. And, you know, the typical image would be that these are right wing academics being set upon by left wing. No, these are all progressive for the most part. These these mm -hmm. academics are all typical academics. They're, they're left of center. and But the the crime that they've committed is saying something that offends some identity politics group. Yeah, or some dogma that they hold near and dear. They this this controversy is an ending, I guess. You you come out with your book, you get the Guggenheim Feminine uh, Guggenheim Fellowship, and then you publish an op-ed on something totally unrelated <laughs> from this controversy about sex and how we we should be honest with our kids that sex is for the most part about pleasure. I get it published in Everyday Feminism. They pull it down. Within hours. Within hours. Didn't tell you, right? Nope, didn't bother to tell yeah. me. What, what does that say about our culture? And do you see any connection between what's happening on campus and what's happening in the broader society with regard to just... You know, so I should explain yeah. a little what happened because yeah. it's kind of hilarious in some ways, right? So... Um, this is actually a piece I published in 2009 about talking to my son about sex, but it was a piece that went viral in, I think, 2014 because Pacific Standard republished it and sent it out, and it went crazy viral then. Yeah. And ever since then, various people have been asking me to reprint it. It's been reprinted in Russian and Korean and mm -hmm. all over the world, right? And I'm happy to do it because it's a story about telling kids the truth about sex, which is sex is about pleasure. So Everyday Feminism asked me, and I did the same thing with them that I do with everybody, which is you're not allowed to change the text. You have to pay me a little bit of money. I think it was 50 bucks or something like mm -hmm. that. You have to acknowledge who I am, provide a link to my books, blah, 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 right? Uh -huh. So... So they say yes, so they do that, and it goes up, and I see on Twitter that it's live, and I was like, oh, okay, so I click on it, but I get 404 file not found. <laughs> and I'm like, that seems odd, all these people were tweeting it, it must have existed, so I write to the editor, and I'll tell you, when I did, I thought to myself, I bet they pulled it because I am supposedly the enemy of the transgender population. Yep. <laughs> and sure enough, they stupidly, that's exactly what they wrote me back, that they had no problem with what was in my essay, but they learned that I was a terrible person in terms of what else I had said 
in my other writing and therefore they had to pull it because my work was not consistent with their agenda, which I find so completely ridiculous. Uh -huh. you know? And once again, lots of people ended up reading an article they'd never read before because it was censored. Yeah. Well, again, getting back to my question, what does it, what does it say a little, what does it say about the culture? You know? Oh, I think it's, you know, this kind of attitude that we cannot have any ambivalence towards other people, that we have to sort of equate individuals with their entire body of work so mm -hmm. that if there's one thing we don't like about anything they've ever said, then we must crush them and get rid of them. It's It really, I mean, we use the phrase witch hunting a lot and we yeah. probably overuse it, but it has that feel to it uh -huh. where basically what you have is if there's one sign that this person has done something you don't like, it's a sign that their soul is corrupt and you have to save them by killing them. Uh -huh. And this ritualistic this stoning really goes on over and over again. Do you see that people aren't engaging with the ideas that you put forth or the criticisms that you put forth and they're rather trying to go after you? Yeah, sometimes they engage the ideas, but it's not uncommon to just sort of do ad hominem attacks and yeah. it gets kind of exhausting. I talk about this regularly in, in talks I give. I just get, give a talk to our interns and we talked about this, but the, the re that's the reason the Federalist Papers, the Anti-Federalist Papers were published anonymously is they wanted people to engage with the ideas and not the person. Uh, you know, as, as tough as our political dialogue is today, it was even worse. In the 18th century, you um, had John Adams and uh, Thomas Jefferson calling each, each other things that you would never see happen today. <laughs> it's not to say that it won't. Um, really? If you know, after to, November. <laughs> I was going to say, Ruth Bader All Ginsburg versus now. Donald Trump, really? Yeah. Well, she's, she apologized. She just recently apologized for that and okay. said she shouldn't I have done that. that. Yeah, that was yesterday. She's like, I'm done talking about this now. <laughs> I don't think she anticipated the fallout that she would get from that. But um, I guess uh, Supreme Court justices aren't supposed to give their opinions. But, you know, that's the reason the Anti-Federalist Papers and the Federalist Papers were published anonymously. anonymously. That's why the reason why people didn't know that the Declaration of Independence was written by Thomas Jefferson when it was first written because he's this young, um, sort of awkward, stuttering uh, lawyer. But you've been in the academy for a while. Academic freedom has it gotten our professors – now walking on more eggshells than they might have been 10, 15, 20 years ago. You spoke a little bit about Northwestern, but after your controversy, has anyone reached out to you outside of Northwestern? Oh, constantly. I'm, I'm constantly uh -huh. getting email from people who are in tough spots. I mean, that's been happening now ever since the Bailey work, so that's been eight years of that. Uh -huh. But when I travel the country, so I've been doing kind of a book tour, trying to rile people up about academic freedom, yeah. and I hear constantly from faculty all over the country about – the difficulties of trying to deal with the current combination of students who have been, m many of them raised in the concept that they shouldn't have to suffer anything. Uh -huh. And if somebody is being unpleasant, they should push back and not shut them down, basically, not have to deal with anybody they don't want to deal with. Yeah. And then on the other end, administrations that are brand obsessed, funding obsessed, who don't want any disruption to the system that might cause a problem in terms of PR, yeah. might cause a problem in terms of politics or funding. And so what you get is you get this regression to the boring, right? Because you get faculty who are terribly afraid to challenge students lest they get in trouble for Title IX or uh -huh. for whatever it is, right? And on the other end, you've got administrators who pretty much give you the message they don't want you rising your head up and doing anything that might bring negative attention. Yeah. And so what you get is a faculty who are starting to function not as a profession in the way it's been, but really as jobs where they go in and try to keep their heads down. Yeah. And I've heard this, frankly, from people just like myself who are old time feminists who have been teaching for years in ways that you know were politically challenging who are now being told you're not allowed to teach in those ways anymore because what you're saying is offensive to this student or offensive uh -huh. to that student or difficult for our donors to understand yeah. and so we're being shut down and when you look at who gets in trouble who gets fired I keep reminding people, it's not the white men, right? It tends to be women, people of color. It tends to be people who are kind of on the edges already politically yeah. who are pushed aside. So it's this misperception a lot of people have that academic freedom and in particular freedom of speech is an issue for white male libertarians. I keep trying to tell people, if you want to look at who's getting in trouble, mm -hmm. it's people like me getting in trouble. Yeah. This change in the culture, does it come as a result of anything that – we're teaching our kids. Uh, you you hear within feminist communities, and you would know more about this than I would, but, but uh, I have a friend and someone who's participating in a movie that we're working on, Can We Take a Joke, Kareth Foster, who went to a all, all women's school. And she talks about how when she was there in the 80s, it was all about empowerment. It was all about no one can bring you down no matter what they say. And now it seems as though assuming 
a mantle of victimhood gives you certain privileges and that you get the power that you so desperately desire by shutting other people up and claiming them to be an oppressor. I think that's right. And, you know, to me, I mean, it, it started in some ways with the problematic self-esteem movement within parenting where the idea was to constantly give yeah. kids positive feedback all of the time mm-hmm. and I think what you end up doing is you raise kids who are used to being constantly judged and they need to be constantly positively judged they cannot yeah. be negatively judged so when you have this sort of helicopter parenting this parenting that is overly invasive in terms of constantly trying to push kids to one end of the shame pride spectrum as I call it in the book I just wrote about talking to your kids about sex you know when you're constantly doing that and constantly trying to, to judge them and push them in one direction they become very used to getting constant positive feedback and never being uncomfortable Mm -hmm. and never being alone with their thoughts for that matter, right? So it is a real problem because you you have students who... who feel when a professor challenges them or gives them a bad grade, you know, it's that it's some sort of personal judgment on them and they feel offended and they fight back through the systems that they have. And a lot of times they are very empowered now to do that. I mean, empowerment was a good party that is and Empowerment was a good thing, but there is a dark side to empowerment, which is when the empowered become sort of the masters and end up controlling us. And the faculty I talk to feel very controlled right now. They do, they? do not feel liberated. They do not feel free to do what they need to do in their classrooms. Who, who are the – FIRE has been you know, f- trying to fight back against this for quite some time now, but who are the people that you look to uh, in the fight against this trend? Well, you guys certainly – I mean, I, I can't tell you how many people I refer to FIRE when they tell me about the problems that they're facing. Um, but, you know – One of the things I'm frustrated with is the AUP tries to take on a lot of these issues. The American, the Association of American uh, University Professors Mm -hmm. tries to take on a lot of these issues, but they're only just now starting to come out with really strong statements on academic freedom. And part of what's happened within universities, as I see it, is over the years, administrations rewarded faculty who got grants and published and did their teaching, but did not reward governmental service within university systems. And as a consequence, the best and the brightest ended up pushing off academic governance onto the slow, old, retiring professors. And little by little, the university systems were taken over by the administration. So the right to say what the policies would be, to make decisions with regard to what oversight boards would exist, et cetera, et cetera. The faculty used to have control over a lot of that, and now the administrations do. And so it's very difficult for the faculty to be empowered in any meaningful way and to be able to fight back against this stuff because they simply have given up on academic governance. So we have to take back academic governance and that's going to be hard work because it's not going to be rewarded. University administrators don't want smart people doing academic governance. They don't want tough people doing academic Mm -hmm. governance. They want easy people. Well, that's what some, that's so fire last year and you're, you're friends with Jeff Stone. Mm -hmm. uh, We got behind his Chicago statement, which is a great statement on principles of uh, free speech and academic freedom at the universities. And we tried to encourage a lot of universities to adopt these principles as sort of a guiding value by which when a controversy arises, they can look to that value and sort of chart a path forward. And we saw that a lot of university senates were adopting or trying to adopt a resolution uh, similar to the Chicago Statement. Often they adjust the first couple of paragraphs to make it relevant to their university, but you'd get an administration that would say, nope, we're not going to put any teeth to this. This isn't going to be enforceable. Um, And so you, you see these these faculty senates that don't have any strength to to do anything in, in in the way that you describe and it's it's sad and i think academic freedom uh suffers as a result of it it does i push the chicago principles all the time and try to get people to specifically work to adopt it and i'm hearing the same thing mm-hmm. which is we're trying to do this but we're being told it's not going to have any meaning to it yeah and you know what we've had Academia 100 years ago, it was very common for deans and university presidents and provosts to have come out through the ranks. They were people who were faculty. They might move university to university, but they were academics. But today what we find is particularly university presidents often are people brought in from outside of academia who have business-oriented mentalities, who are basically judged according to the business model, right? Are you bringing in enough money? Yeah. Are, do we have, are we in the black? And does our brand have a solid kind of concept behind it? That's how they're being judged. And so that's part of the problem is that the administration is not us. They're yeah. not our people. We saw that at Mount St. Mary's University. I don't know if you're yes. familiar with that case. Or this year where the president said uh, in a conversation that they needed to put guns to the little bunnies or something like that. That was horrifying. Had. Yeah, well, he, he came from a, a private business background and 
quickly went back to that Where background. Where apparently it's okay it's, to shoot people. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> he was talking about it in the context of weeding out low-performing freshman students. Uh, but And then he went after tenured faculty members and right so so it was disturbing what he said but what was more disturbing was when he went after his critics yes yeah when he went after his critics and they they also joined joined northwestern university on the worst schools for free speech list so for you i I think it comes come a lot of this comes back to um the corporatization of the university and bill bill peace as the fallout to what happened with the atrium wrote extensively about the corporatization of the university and how it comes there. And it's, I think that's a thread to the conversation that's lost in most of these cases. I agree. No, I talk about the triumvirate, you know, in terms of what's coming after us in academic freedom. And one is stuff on the right, right, mm-hmm. where particularly through large donations and through uh, Republican legislatures, what's happening is the shutting down of programs that people on the right don't like. On the left, the abuse of Title IX and this safe space stuff and trigger warnings to shut down. Seasons, yeah. Absolutely. Shutting uh, um, free speech zones, oh, yeah. shutting down any kind of dialogue that is uncomfortable. And mm-hmm. then the third one, which is really really, I think, pretty nasty is the corporatization of America. Yeah. yeah. And thankfully, we have some good advocates on all sides of those issues. I know you're friends with Dan Savage, but many people on the left, you know, Glenn Greenwald, Jonathan Rausch, these are all people that we've interviewed who are just aghast at what's happening. And hopefully the tide will turn here soon. I work every day with reporters and, um, you know, columnists, and it seems that they're on the side of free speech. Um, it's some folks on the campuses that that we have some work to do with, but, uh, well, they're historically naive. And I think any work you can do helping them understand the history of oppression on campuses and how, you know, they, they don't really want to be the McCarthy's right. But it seems like they don't understand the ways in which they're going in that direction. Yeah. Well, the, the, one of the things that they're doing, so you have all these students and faculty members, and it's not all students, of course, I don't want to paint with a broad brush here, but they're appealing to an administration for help implement speech codes, disinvite the speaker, give us trigger warnings, when at the same time they're being critical of admin- administrations for encouraging culture of impression, to to not being supportive of minority students or low-income students. So it's like you're trying to give these peop- these very people who you're so critical of more power to control how you live your lives yep. and how you talk with each other. And I think Glenn Greenwald on our second podcast talked about this. He said, even if you don't like these ideas from a principled standpoint. From a tactical standpoint, giving people in authority the power to censor, the power to police speech always backfires against the least powerful. And that that really stuck with me. And I hope someone, uh, we're doing our best here, gets that message across to both the students and faculty members that are calling for these these safe spaces, these trigger warnings, disinvitations of speakers, and and more speech codes. Um, before, before we go here, because I know you have to go off and give your speech, <laughs> You're you're a Hoosier, right? Or you, no, you went I'm to a school New Yorker. In, but you I went, went to, to Indiana, in Indiana. And I, ha- yes. I had to bring that up because I went to Indiana as well. Oh, good. Yeah. Did you go to? Were you at the Bloomington campus? Yes. Oh, okay. were, were, were you, you were studying this stuff that you got their, your PhD there, right? Yes, my PhD was in history and philosophy of science at Indiana. Mm-hmm. People always assume it was at the Kinsey, but the Kinsey did not <laughs> grant PhDs. <laughs> it's a perfect place for you, though. Yeah, Kinsey I actually Institute. didn't do any work at the Kinsey because at the time it was in such political turmoil. It was kind of not a place you could get any work done. So, uh, yeah. Have you worked with them since? Um, a little bit. There, you know, that's a place that does get very politicized because right. of um, issues of sexuality. And the current director is somebody I've criticized because uh-huh. she sort of seems to have this approach that she thinks that we should only talk about sex in the context of relationships. And I think that gotcha. we should talk about sex outside of relationships as well. Right. And all its various permutations, exactly. right? Exactly. <laughs> Whatever we need to talk about. Well, Alice, before we go, anything else you want? No, this has been great. Up? Thank you so much for having yeah, me. Yeah, and thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. 